So tell us about your background and how your entrepreneurial journey got started in fashion. I'm originally from Wales in the UK. Um, and when I was younger, I've always been interested in the arts, mostly drama, TV, film, you know, producing and things like that. But when I was younger, I didn't know that fashion could be a career. I thought it was um, just a hobby. Uh, I was given a sewing machine when I was 11 years old. So from a very young age, I've been putting everything through a sewing machine and, and I just thought it was a hobby. Um, most people where I'm from don't believe that, you know, the fashion industry is even an industry. It's one that's considered, you know, quite shallow or superficial. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't until I took textiles and, and you know, went into uh, an art foundation course specializing in fashion textiles uh, that I realized it could be a real career for me. So um, that's basically how I ended up uh, studying at Parsons School of Design, and that was uh, in 2011. Going back to your time at Parsons School of Design, you won Women's Wear Designer of the Year Award in 2015 for your collection called Seated Design. So you designed a thesis collection that focused on the seated body in a wheelchair. Tell us a bit more about the process behind designing that collection, and also what inspired you to focus on this particular topic? As I mentioned, when I was younger, I didn't, you know, for me, fashion was this very glamorous, distant land. Um, and, and I thought you had to be a certain someone to fit into fashion. Um, it wasn't until I moved to New York City and I was studying at Parsons that I really realized that you know, there are so many types of people on this planet. And um, I remember one particular day I was looking at a size six mannequin thinking, like, who is this mannequin? It doesn't represent anyone I really know. And I, I, I just had this feeling of, you know, I felt really deflated and uninspired because I just felt like everyone was, you know, on a conveyor belt churning out the same stuff, the same dress, the same top. And even, you know, in the room, everyone was creating very similar work. And I just said, well, I don't really want to not use my brain. <laughs> is actually what I said. And um, so I was told, well, why don't you challenge that? Why don't you challenge the status quo? Why don't you do something that can make a difference? And I had no idea where I was going to land with that uh challenge uh, but it just so happened to be with a conversation with a family member who has cerebral palsy and I had realized it had gone it had taken me 20 years to ask my cousin you know really personal questions about how he got dressed each day and and that's when I realized that that was a problem in itself that I hadn't even asked him you know about his needs and it's specifically to something that I do or wanted to do for a living which is create clothes and so after that conversation my eyes were opened and I decided that I had to engage with the disability community I just wanted to learn and hear and listen and and, and understand if there was anything that people you know, if there was any challenges or any similarities with my cousin's story. And it turned out after I had spoken and, you know, had all these groups and gatherings that um, his story was incredibly similar to many, many other people. Um, and that's when I started working with a, a lady who has multi-sclerosis. Her name is Ronnie Ellen Raymond, a dear friend and mentor of mine. And, and um, that's when I got to learn a lot about her life and, and you know, really what she would want to see out of the fashion industry and um, the modifications she would like to see made in clothing. And, and that's how Seated Design uh, came about. Um, I said, even when I was graduating, um, this was an unfinished collection. Like I just, I remember like feeling embarrassed because I hadn't finished. And actually, I remember at the time my thesis professors were telling me, "Lucy, that's what a thesis is." <laughs> they were like, "It's it's the start of something, you know." And and so when I graduated and and people really responded to the work, I I felt like I was you know just starting and scratching the surface of something bigger, but I didn't really know what it was. So now you've completed your senior thesis at Parsons and you're making your transition out into the industry at large. You are awarded an amazing opportunity, a fellowship uh, done by Eileen Fisher in partnership with the CFDA. 
What was that experience like working with Eileen Fisher during that fellowship? And what sparked the decision uh, in you to take the leap and start your own business following that fellowship? Because you gained a lot of momentum early on after you graduated from Parsons and got a lot of exposure. You could have worked at any major company and built out a traditional career in fashion. Why did you decide to start your own business at this early stage in your life? I, uh, I never ever set out to own my own business. I never did. I never wanted to. I always wanted to be a designer that had a legacy, um, whether that was within a company, but I just never thought of the responsibility of, um, you know, owning my own company. So as you mentioned, when I was graduating, I did have job offers and um, even navigating that and choosing, um, you know, where I would go um, was a scary um, concept to me. But I did know one thing was I wasn't going to leave Parsons and start my own uh, brand there and then because I felt like I wasn't equipped. I had no idea what I was getting myself in for. Um, so when I, I knew I wanted a job because I wanted to, you know, have more experience under my belt, I wanted to learn under someone. So when the CFDA teamed up with Eileen Fisher, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm so lucky because Eileen Fisher is a real leader. Like to have worked in that company, to meet the staff, to see the difference she is making to the world and the way other companies think, the way she shares her resources. For me, I just couldn't believe the Eileen effect. Um, that's what we used to call it, the Eileen effect on everyone. It was this real, like, that woman is amazing. And when she walked into a room, it wasn't like, you know, in some designers who walk into a room and everyone sort of like gets a bit nervous or is like, oh my goodness, the designer's over there. Eileen is, don't mind me. Like, you know, just the most effortless woman. And I just thought that is a true leader, that she knows how important her staff are to her. She knows that, you know, without them, nothing's possible, but she's the one who inspires them. And for me, I just thought that was an incredible experience to have learned a lot about operations, leadership, sustainability, um, product pricing, uh, you know, things like shipping duties, uh, import, export, anything and everything in between. And then, of course, creating our own collection. After I had a taste of doing that with uh, two other um, women, Carmen and, and Tess, who are also from Parsons, who also um, were the, the prize winners, um, the fellowship winners. Um, it was like we got a mini taste of what it would be like to to run our run our, run our own thing, I guess. And uh, I was scared, but it, it propelled me to say, OK, I think I've got the most holistic, you know, view of, of everything, not just design, but what all the other things that fit in between. And, and so after that, it was, um, I wasn't sure where I was going to go, but I just, I will never thank Eileen Fisher and the CFDA enough for um, that year that I learned all of that. That fellowship sounds like it was such an amazing experience and foundational part of your journey. Now, when you started Fora, a lot of the foundational data and research that you needed in order to create the right products for the disabilities community wasn't readily available. You had to go out and build this foundation and also create frameworks in order to serve that community. Tell us what that process was like, building a business and entering this new untapped, underserved frontier. Yeah, thanks. That was, um, it was really daunting, but um, I, I feel, I feel like when I was younger, um, moving, you know, moving away from my family home as well, um, my grandfather used to say to me, that girl's got guts. And so whatever I wanted to do, I knew that I had to be gutsy about it. And um, I also think a big part of it is in, in my nature and in the way even, you know, I run for or the, the way the, the people who attract me are always very curious and curiously minded people. 
And so I think I went into starting the business with more of a curiosity and a gutsy approach. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I think that was probably best. Everything I have done um, in my career to date has been a complete unknown. And it's just been a lot of throwing yourself into the deep end. And and so I think with, um, you know, starting the business, I also knew that I wasn't an expert at finance and I wasn't an expert at operations and I wasn't an expert at customer service or uh, any of the other things that you need to run a business. So the best part is obviously surrounding yourselves with people who do know those things and and the people who are experts. So I was really lucky that, you know, graduating from Parsons and then having having met all the people at Eileen Fisher and, you know, there was just so many people in the, in my network that I could email or, or ask advice from and not be afraid to, to, to ask a, what would be called a stupid question um, and make sure I could really, you know, pull my resources in and, and just learn and learn and learn as much as I can. And I think that was step one. And then step two was obviously I went into an accelerator program called XRC Labs. That was that was even more of a deep end because I felt I was the only person that was actually a designer in the cohort. So there's 10 other companies and everyone had you know expertise in so many other different areas that I knew nil about. And so it was really good to like make friends and 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 learn from them and 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 all the mentors who come through the program. Yeah, and it's really good to be able to share like my resources on the design side of things. So I think that was you know what it was like. It was really just you know figuring it out as you go along, making sure that you can pull on your network uh, and and attending as many events as possible just to learn and absorb everything you possibly could. So you're not a typical fashion designer. You're applying this unique problem-solving lens to create beautiful product that has a particular utility function and solves a problem for an underserved community. Let's dive into your product development process a bit more. Going back to the foundational research uh, that we mentioned previously, how did you go about building that foundation and creating the right products for this community? It's more, okay, I want to learn, I want to listen, I want to engage. And so this, the market research was very interesting because as it turns out, um, uh, you know, designing for people who have disabilities. And when you try to access any market data, unfortunately, uh, people are bucketed in ways that they necessarily wouldn't I- even identify with. Mm-hmm. So e- even if you want to know how many people use a wheelchair uh, in the world, um, some countries don't unfortunately have wheelchairs or don't have the right terrain to offer wheelchairs. So you will never truly get the data, um, which is a, a problem in itself. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we realized, well, OK, we really have to just create the data ourselves. Um, we also realized that we were going to get it wrong. <laughs> that was also, we, we were just like when we couldn't access any data or we couldn't figure it out, we were just like, let's take the risk and figure it out as we go along. So we worked with many different people, different ages, different occupations, different abilities, different genders, different, you know, ethnicities, different cultures. And we heard a range of contrasting opinions because we weren't just trying to uh, design something um, that had, I guess, that had a very strong, well, it has a strong aesthetic, but we didn't want it to, you know, when you look at brands, like, for example, I would say Tommy Hilfiger's preppy. Um, and, you know, you look at other brands and you say, oh, they were minimal. We had to be careful on on uh, how to create a product that would suit all these people, <laughs> which is very hard to do. So what we did was we looked at the brands that we thought were doing it. And of course, we looked at Apple. We looked at Lego, you know, brands that understood play playfulness intuition you know design that you can't quite put your finger on it but you you think it's nice to look at sort of design and and so going into these meetings we realized that whatever we did the end result had to be open-ended and playful we weren't here to dictate someone we were here to say we want to offer tools and we want you to feel that you can express yourself using our products 
Um, but we also noticed that throughout this pro- process, something that I did just- during, like just to be clear, like this was during like uh, like user testing. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So through user testing, um, we started to realize all these findings that we hadn't set out for in the beginning. Um, and, you know, the, the doing all of these, having all of these gatherings and interactions uh, made us realize that we were developing like true relationships with our customer. And that inherently would impact any de- business decision um the market research is still wavy we I, we're still learning and we're still developing it now that we are in the market um and now the more that people know who we are the more willing people are and other companies private companies are to share their data with us which is amazing um but just in terms of propelling the business forward having all these focus groups interactions with the people and the user testing and all the people that we aim to serve has meant that our stakes are higher because our business decisions now have a face to them as well like what would so and so feel about this they really are like very much part of the company so we it's very it's it's almost good it's easy to make a, des- a, des- a business decision because we know our audience so well, but it also makes it that little bit harder when you feel like you've got these genuine friendships and emotions on the line as well. So I think that's something I didn't expect, um, which makes me think we're onto something special. So let's circle back a bit to your thesis collection, Seated Design, just so everyone can see the evolution from that point to where you are now with Fora. See the design focused on apparel. Now tell everyone what types of products that you create at your current company, Fora. So I started designing apparel, um, which consisted of jackets and shirts and and things that had easy openings and clothes that were easy to put on and take off. Um, And it evolved into accessories, um, accessories specific to wheelchairs. Um, and so the reason being for that was uh, when clothes are on, they're on. I'm not saying there's still not difficulties. Um, there's still, you know, many things that do still need to be innovated and altered. But um, what I started noticing when we started all these conversations was um, a lot of individuals didn't have anywhere to place their valuables or their personal belongings when they were out and about. So a lot of people were um, sitting on phones, wallets and keys or having a bag on the back of the the chair, um, which is out of sight. And a a lot of people said they felt quite anxious having having a bag with their, their belongings in when someone could reach in and grab something from their bag um and and so instead sitting on phones wallets and keys and and people and my favorite um was people who have been stashing lip gloss and money in their shoes and I was like oh my goodness um and so when we started to realize like all these little hacks and like all these ways to hide and store and stash uh, their their belongings it was uh oh okay well we really need to design um accessories that attach onto mobility devices so people can be more hands-free or more accessible and have more control and independence over their things and then um, it evolved into uh, and this is just the most uh, amazing conversation when you're saying okay so what do you do with this and then you start really learning how you know people's day-to-day life is um, what do you do with a hot cup of coffee and that's when you start thinking okay, so you have to have a cup holder. Like then then more products keep, you know, filtering in and adding themselves to your product pipeline. So that's how I evolved from apparel um, into accessories. The other um, concept was uh, everything needed to be open-ended and modular. As I mentioned before, it was about, you know, how do you please many people? Um, But also this isn't exclusive. The brand is designed for people who have disabilities and who predominantly use wheelchairs. That doesn't mean that's our end goal. It means that we care and we have put our effort and our investment to people who have disabilities first and not as an afterthought. But it just means that the bags themselves that attach to the wheelchairs through our our, um, we have a, an attachment that goes onto a 
onto a wheelchair or a device and then uh, a cup holder or an, an accessory or a, a one of our bags can attach and detach onto the uh, onto the um onto the device whenever somebody wants them to um so that just means that the piece can be worn and used on standing individuals as well um, and enjoyed by people who may just want to wear them on the body and you know roll with the, the bag across the body and so it, it just opens all these opportunities for okay so what does inclusive design mean because we've started here we see the bags are now getting used on you know people who don't have disabilities too um and that's really how the conversation is still expanding to this day and will we go back into apparel will we introduce apparel later on it's still a bit of a question mark but um from what we've seen so far uh you know the accessories are going to keep evolving so yes you've created these beautiful accessories but underneath that you've really created a unique system of attachments for the wheelchair and the products that fit with this attachment system. Creating original product that doesn't yet exist on the market, it's so important to protect that. So you filed patents. Tell us a bit more about the process that you went through to file your patents and why you made that decision to protect your work. We were told, um, quite early on you what and also just as a business um what is your intellectual property you know if i was going to buy this company what am i getting <laughs> uh, quite often uh you know how acquisitions happen it's like okay so what is your real intellectual uh, property and 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 how can this you know first of all how is it protected um and then what are the opportunities that um you know that arrive because of this protection and because of what you've created. And I think, you know, protecting that is so important because it, in the design world, uh, you know, knockoffs happen, people will copy, people will steal. Um, and I think for us, we, you know, we could have been a big brand that did this. We could have been a brand that decided to put a lot of investment or create a division to do this, but there wasn't any, there weren't any company that were actually doing that. So, you know, we were a small company that put our, you know, three years of our life into developing this. So of course we wanted to protect it so that, you know, we could create opportunity for the company and also the world after that um, under the right resources. So uh, the process of protecting our like designs and um, you know, our the utility and the functionality of our pieces is, um, is very complicated. Uh, it's very complicated, but it is very, very important. Um, we just received our first patent, uh, which is incredible, but we're obviously still going through, um, and this has been a two-year process. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it takes it takes a very, very long time, but it, it, it also shows that you know your industry too, because you have to show prior art, you have to show anything that could potentially be in breach of someone else's patent uh, which a lot of people don't even know um so you do you have to hire a lawyer and you have to you know go through um all the procedures and um but i think you know it's incredibly important to protect your design for example if we have ip that has a protection um for me that having the ip was important because i just feel that i would be concerned if brands would not do this for the right reasons and with a protection um it, it just basically says you have more control of of the way in which people would go about using this design or using you know the the property um, and you'd have more control uh, over that and and therefore I felt like that would create um better change and not fall into the wrong hands and that was the way I always looked at it like I don't want to harm a community here like we want to make sure everyone can benefit. So, so how do how do we now partner with companies and license out this IP so that other companies can do it with their resources? And that was quite important as a business, but also culturally and socially as well. So going back to the point that you brought up about protecting the community that you serve, you've really made a conscious effort at every step of the way to 
include the disabilities community in your design process. Why is that an important part of your brand's ethos? Why is that important to you? Well, first of all, people aren't stupid. Customers aren't stupid. They can see through, everyone can see through everything. And um, when things are tone deaf, it's not, it doesn't look good for a company. And I think, you know, making sure that we, the the disability community always, a lot of people have a joke because you can tell when a co- when a company has got it wrong and and really missed the mark and it's not just the disability community in fact it's any minority you can always tell when someone has got it wrong and they haven't done their research so i think for us it's just so important because you know we want to make sure that change is possible we also want to create opportunity i think you know we're such a small team it's three we're three people and um i think creating opportunity like using my skills and my, you know, I would say the opportunities I've been given to create employment opportunities or to create um, designs that can create a better future and a better livelihood for someone is, is crucial. And so having the feedback and making sure we're constantly listening, but also ready to, to say that we've done something wrong and ready to say and admit that, you know, if we have missed the mark, learn from it. What have we done? How can we change? And how can we make sure that this never happens again? And I think it's just any company um, would be smart in doing that. I think now companies are starting to do that. Um, are starting to really evaluate you know especially when it comes to inclusivity and diversity are now starting to really put these measures and and um, structures in place that they never had before it's good for us to know that we've been doing that from day one um, but it, it is just important because that's that's the future and and people don't want to settle for less and and that's it that's just why it's important it's just also important because the disability community are the most marginalized one of the most marginalized communities and especially when you look at healthcare and the pandemic has taught us so much about the inefficiencies in healthcare Mm -hmm. and then you think about um, the lack of resources for the disability community the lack of access to healthcare and it's and then of course when you put them all into one bucket and you realize okay so there's lack of healthcare um, this lack of support and mentorship opportunities. How are people, you know, getting into school? How are they getting into education? Well, we're not even creating the opportunities. So we cannot source talent because we haven't even created the opportunities. So I think quite a lot of this brand is about, you know, making sure that opportunities can be created. And, you know, what does that look like in the future? Does it look like scholarship? Does it look like mentorship opportunities? And I think making sure that we are constantly engaging on that aspect and not just product is is also really important. So on your point about team, tell us how you went about building your original team as a startup company, because the team is such a foundational part of everything that you go about building. I think a lot of it is dating. Oh, I hear this when I when I started out a lot of people advised me to oh just date them for a little bit and I was always <laughs> just gonna date someone for a little bit but it's it is true you really have to find a flow with someone and you really have to if you especially in the startup the hours you put in are 20 24 7 sometimes and around the clock so it really is that the, the first bunch of you are really are a marriage you just you're in it together you go through the highs and the lows together you go through all the mini wins and all the trials and um so actually the first person uh who really came onto the team was Jonas Kaustila he is a an incredible industrial designer and he was um you know the first employee uh, and and I guess I consider him my design partner. Um, and you know he he went to Parsons, had a master's in industrial design, and had the sim similar way of thinking, a similar approach, similar aesthetic. And and so working with him and making sure that we meshed and and gelled and and challenged each other, and also respected each other enough to call each other out when we we felt like things were going wrong. I think that is really um, important in building a team. Like, are you comfortable enough and respectful enough that you can you can you have the difficult conversations Um, and then everyone else like so you know there wasn't just there's three of us but 
um throughout the process there were obviously i would say probably about 40 people have actually touched this company and and impacted what it is today so it's not it's okay so on paper we're three but we're actually so much more than that because there have been you know people who did branding with us there was a team for that there were people who um, helped us with our operations there were mentors who literally set up our operations and warehouse for us um there were you know there were people who um you know did the website photographer and then of course there's everyone else consultants advisors the people who we've worked with who've shaped our product to what it is today um and then beyond that uh it's choosing those people yeah you have to interview and and also being so young um I found that quite daunting at first like how do I interview someone um, I've not long had an interview myself um, and you know that that was scary uh, who's even going to take me seriously like someone could be 20 years older than me and you know why should they listen to me uh, but one thing I started to realize was people wanted to work with companies that had a mission so I remember one time I put an ad out for we were looking for more of an operational role. And the response I had was there were just so many people who were, you know, three times my age. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, this is incredible and amazing resumes. I'm not equipped to interview these people. Um, and so that's when you really have to make sure that you've got amazing mentors and advisors who are experts at what they do, who can step in and help you with that process and who can join interviews or even you know, do the interviews on your behalf and make sure that you have that you all know what you're you're looking for and it's very well communicated. So that communication is 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 very important. Um, because at that point as well being young and being a young entrepreneur you don't know what you don't know so you know you're going to make mistakes and you know there's going to be things that don't work out but usually it's mutual I think there's only been like one occasion where something hasn't worked out but it was quite mutual it was like the elephant in the room and in that case it's like oh okay we all know and it and, and it feels quite good but um yeah building a team is is uh, is a long process and it's the most important one but once you get it right which doesn't happen overnight it, it's a marriage it does take time um then you've got to hold on to to those people and make sure that you can you can keep going and and learning from from that so mentors are also such a crucial part of your development as an entrepreneur and for building a business how did you go about building your tribe of mentors and advisors? Because you seem to have a, a re- cultivated a really great group of people who continue to support you. So it's easy to build these relationships. Tell us also how you go about maintaining those relationships and making sure that everyone is kept engaged over a longer period of time. Okay, so first of all, don't have too many mentors. (laughs) There was a time when I felt like everyone wanted to help, but I didn't know how they could help. And then I was also quite confused. So that taught me two things. One, I have too many people. Um, And the second one was, what is my ask? You know, what, why is it that I can't figure out where they can help me and that was a big problem in itself um I need to know what my ask is and what what you know purpose a mentor and advisor serves and I think for me it's nice to keep the the it's nice to keep the group small Mm -hmm. for me the best case scenario is when you can put if you can feel comfortable putting all your mentors and advisors in one room that's that is really important too like to see that energy is is quite important um the reason I like the idea of putting everyone together or having a meeting where everyone is in one space is because the conversation, you know, everyone is there for one reason and or everyone is there for a number of reasons. But um, the conversation is so stimulating. It's so rich and sparks fly and you've got different, you know, people who have different experts contributing um, and moments like that are magical. And, and so that's what I'm what that's what I'm looking for is will people work together as well? Um, not that people often sign up for that, um, but I don't mind bringing them all in <laughs> together. Um, the other thing in curating mentors is you have to 
figure out, you know, what the ask is, you know, where can they be beneficial? People really need clarity. Um, people really want to know how they can help. So if you can't tell them how they can help, then you don't want to waste their time. You know, mentors and advisors have, you know, their time is valuable. And as a founder entrepreneur, your time is also valuable. So you've just got to be specific and you've got to be clear. So open transparency and communication, um, frequent updates, it's all very, very important. Um, for me, I have a lot of emotional supported mentors um, because it can be overwhelming. So I would say one mentor in particular, um, she has fallen into uh, being a, an emotional support system for me because she has run businesses. Um, but she's someone who I am not ashamed to pick up the phone and tell her that I'm frightened or um, that I'm I'm worried and about something and 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 it's about business and it's about relationship management or or anything like that. And it's so nice to to make sure you have mentors but also know you uh, as a person. I think that's important, very important. And um, everything else, I would say, find mentors who who have an expertise that you don't. So I've got mentors who help me with finance um, or advisors who help me with finance, uh, marketing. Um, yep, those you know, complimentary, filling those complimentary. Operate, yeah, operation. Oh, okay. Basically everything I'm not. <laughs> yeah, so that's important. It's like, what, what am I good at? What am I not good at? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Okay, so these are my weaknesses. Who can can really help guide me with that the other thing is not to abuse people like I wouldn't want to like abuse anyone and they and just like oh you know pop up every time I need something that's not going to work it's also got to be kind of two-way a lot of mentors want to mentor because they love giving they mm -hmm. they love giving back they want to help someone and and show them please don't do the bad stuff I did um, which is amazing. But then at the same time, they also, I, at least I found with my mentors, love being around, you know, inventive ideas, designy type people. So it's been really a, a wonderful relationship. So are there any specific tips that you would give to an entrepreneur who's watching this interview right now? What types of systems have you used that have worked for you when it comes to updating your mentors and helping to maintain these relationships? Are there, um, you know, updates that you send out um, to, to keep them informed and to help them see or identify what your needs and priorities might be and, and how they fit in in serving those? I've got into a rhythm now of doing quarterly updates mm -hmm. um I do and with some people I'll check in monthly mm -hmm. um and and some of it can be a conversation that's not that strategic where it will just be a conversation like an update and then that person might say hey you know that's funny you said that um because I just saw someone recently I want to connect you with this person how you know you know how random that we were both going through the same thing and if you don't do that you would never have that conversation and that introduction or that moment of, of oh, what a surprise, you know? Um, and so uh, you also, like in those, I think it's really important when you're giving these updates to say what what you're currently challenged with. Um, because a lot of these people want to say, I can help with that, or I can, you know, take that off your plate. People just want to help. Um, and so it is, I, I've learned to do it quarterly, um, but that's because we are investment backed and, you know, I have an obligation to also make sure people are updated quarterly. Um, for everyone else, it really is, is monthly um, and it's just a really nice rhythm and it's a tool. I, I What I do is I make sure that I have everyone's emails and I will treat it as a whole group of people. And I will say, you know, like, hello, everyone, you know, me again or whatever I say. Um, and I will just uh, give an update in one place and everyone has access to it. And it's very open and it's very much like here's what's going on. And just so you're aware, um, here's our wins and here's what we're working on. And, you know. Obviously, there has to be some confidentiality there. That's the other thing is you've got to make sure that people aren't just going to hit forward and like blast it out. So these are people that you that that are either invested or engaged in your business frequently. So it's a group of people.
So you mentioned being investor back. Let's talk about investors and fundraising. At what point did you decide that it was the right time for you to raise external funding to continue developing and growing the company? Um, it was, I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I was getting into. I I just was very excited by the prospect of you know, starting this company and 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 putting ideas out into the world and and you know curating a vision with incredible people. And um, so when I when I had the first um, the first amount of invest uh, the first investment, um, I worked really incredibly hard to to prove a concept. Um, there was a demo day. And at that demo day, which hosted, you know, um, buyers, merchants, um, investors, um, you know, just a whole network of people. And this demo day is really about, you know, getting your ideas out and showing where you were in your process. And, and a lot of it, a lot of fundraising opportunity does happen at demo days, um, investor demo days or, or even, you know, just uh, celebratory demo days. Um, and after the demo day, which was after XRC Labs, um, I remember a group of people, um, you know, come up, come up to me and say, I would love to support you um, and I, or I would love to invest. And <laughs> I was shocked. Um, I remember being elated, thinking, like, I can't believe I'm actually going to do this. But I knew it was right because I knew we had started something and I knew I wanted to see it through. And I knew that that was not possible without help and resources and funding. Um, I knew I was taking on a responsibility and I had to take a hard look at myself and say, are you ready for this journey? And of course I was so ready for the journey. Um, and then after that, it was, um, I, I did a, a round, I raised a, a small amount of money um, and you know, I used it to create the products and you know, really bring the team together. And you know, the next steps was it was what I would call like an incubation phase, where it was just get this, get this to the next level, do what you set out to do, get the product done, and it happened. And then, of course, more opportunities come because the more people can see that you're you're propelling and you're moving forward, and then oh, maybe she's got it in her. <laughs> maybe maybe she knows how to how to do this run a team and 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 run a company but it was it was moving in the right direction and then and then it led to another round of funding um where it was like look we achieved what we said we were going to achieve and we're ready to to hit this baby home like let's do this and and that's really what it was like although that on paper and the way I just told that story made it sound like we were like yeah just collecting money that's not how it goes. It's not like, yay, we're so good. Like everyone throw money at us. And, and, you know, here's my contract and here's, here's the, the terms, here's my term sheet and everything. It is not that easy. It, it, it takes months of preparation. It takes months of pitching. It takes months of mentally preparing yourself. Um, I would prepare with a group of people and I would tell them to rip me apart. And it was, it was just horrible. Like those, those days are horrible when you are feeling constantly rejected um and you know you can't sleep I couldn't sleep or eat for like oh, two weeks or three weeks at a time where I was just like this is so intense um but what happens is all you need I think Lady Gaga says this all the time um and something like you only need one person to really believe in you here's my cat <laughs> She believes in me. Um, she loves me. She believes in me. Um, you just need one person to believe in you. But that's actually true in the investment world, too. If you've got someone who is, you know, very well respected, who is willing to vouch for you, that person can can really change your life and really open doors for, for the company. And and I think that that's also about finding finding those um, supporters. And, and that's what it looked like for me is I happened to find some incredible investors who were willing to go the extra mile to help. And um, and that's how it and that's how it evolved. Yes. And entering an agreement with an investor is like a marriage. It's so important for a founder and their investors to be aligned on the same values. It runs so much deeper than just getting a check written. Your expectations of what 
your vision of your company is and their expectation of what growth looks like for them and how you achieve that growth totally has to be in alignment. I have actually turned away from a from a few people because I felt like this is not going to work. Like our values are not aligned. Also, I remember at one point, I am not afraid to talk about this, but I remember when I didn't see any woman in any meeting, that was a red flag to me as well. I remember just walking in and thinking, how are these people even going to understand what we are trying to do? And not just that, it's you do have to look at the build of a team. Like that's important to me. Um, to see if you know they have team representation and um, and I feel like that's just as important you have to do your research uh, on them just as much as they are doing their diligence on you and so there are times where it's not going to work out and it's not going to be mutual and then you just have to say you know it's not going to work out Um, and and walk away I think that's uh, you know that's as important as obviously the money the money is, it, some people will say it doesn't, the check size doesn't necessarily matter if the person can offer you a, so much in terms of, of knowledge and resource and other non-monetary resources as well. So I think, um, yeah, it's not just uh, about the money. It's re- in fact, it's way more <laughs> than that. Oh, yeah, um, expertise as in some places <laughs> is important and also their connections. Because you you need partnerships and other connections to to grow the business. Aside well, from- that's exactly it. And and again, it's kind of similar to the going back to the mentorship and advisory conversation. Um, different investors offer different things, so it's about curating. You know, can can these investors also work together? I I really do like to curate. Um, you know, create an extended team, and that's really what I think is important. Um, luckily, I think. Honestly, I do think we are lucky that everyone who we have involved in the company, um, I think are really, really wonderful people. I really do. I believe in them and I hope they believe in us. And I, I, well, I know they do. Um, but it's just I, I respect uh, I respect everyone. So um, it's been even though it's been difficult, it's it's um, I think we're in a good place. So with everything that you've learned thus far on your journey and your experience running a business, what are three key points that you would give to an entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur who is thinking about launching a brand today or who's just started a brand? The first is um, have a purpose. The first is to, to make sure that whatever it is that you want to do that you can see yourself doing it for the long haul I think having a purpose is important because even if a company or a business fails it should be something that you know you want to continue working on um it may not be necessarily a company but it's a purpose and a mission in life and for me I think when I graduated from Parsons um with that thesis collection it started this you know fire in me it really created a a purpose that was bigger than me it was it's much bigger than Fora I would say the second thing is um like you said earlier uh, find your tribe you you can't do it alone it's a lonely road um starting a business is one of the most isolating experiences that um, you know I've ever had to go through um I think you need people who know you around you for me I have a really wonderful family who keep me grounded and I and I consider that to be one of the most important things for me but no matter who you find supportive I think you if you're starting a business you and you've got your purpose you also need to know who you can turn to um and and who's got your back I think that's really important the last one is is and it's it's probably the one that I started with earlier is you just got to go for it like you've got to have guts and I think no business is is you can be timid when you're making decisions and you can be skeptical and you can evaluate the risks but you've still got to be bold and I think um 
I think that's key to to pushing businesses forward and, and taking on, you know, even bigger risks and, and making sure that you're thinking, thinking larger than you yourself. I think you've just got to be bold. And those are the three things, you know, find a purpose, you know, find your support or your tribe. And the last one is just to be bold about it. And tell us, what's the main thing that keeps you going as an entrepreneur? Oh, I know what keeps me going. Sometimes I will look myself in the mirror and I will just say, I'm done. Like I am so done with this. I, I'm packing it in. I, this is not my life anymore. I will have those days where someone needs to talk me around. And, and again, I pull on the people who know me who are like, no, Lucy, stop saying this. You won't, you won't do this now. You've got so much to give. But for me, the thing that like really, you know, keeps me going is uh is the community, the customers, the people who who buy our products. Sometimes I, you know, say I'm having a terrible day, things are, you know, everything's gone wrong. You can receive an email from a customer that will just reduce you to tears. That is when I asked, I've asked myself before, I wonder with all these businesses going under and and re and um you know, readapting or finding new ways to work through this pandemic. Uh, you know, obviously, I I was wondering what would happen to Fora, and you know, will we battle this storm, and 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 what will happen? And uh, but I wasn't too worried. And and the reason is, I was at first, but I wasn't after. And the reason is because I had to ask myself, would people miss our company? And I realized that yes, there is such a loyal customer base who would be devastated if we disappeared. And for that reason alone, um, that's what keeps me going. Just knowing that we are doing something that makes a huge difference to someone's life. So yeah, an email can uh, change my day, just like an email from a customer that's like, I don't know, my dog helped, my service dog has been carrying my bag around. And I'm like, oh my God, like we had no idea we catered to animals. Like that was really cool to to, to, to see that. But yeah, that's really what, um, that, and again, that's probably the purpose side of everything. Like what's your purpose? Well, that was my purpose. And the customers reaffirmed that and uh, the people who we work with. So. So speaking of the pandemic, it's so important as an entrepreneur to be nimble because you never know what's going to happen on a day-to-day basis. Something is bound to blow up or break at any given moment. And this is before COVID even happened. This is a regular day. So now that we are in the midst of this challenging time that everyone's been trying to navigate how has it been for you as a business owner navigating this period in time? I think, you know, because it's been three years of being a circus plate spinner, like, you know, don't let the plates drop and being a Swiss army knife and making sure we were a jack of all trades. Uh, I think, you know, a pandemic, whilst it was devastating to not, uh, well, to see what was going on in the world and also to see the communities that were hit, um, being an entrepreneur and being in startup mode means that you're always ready for something just oh it's like oh what now like what fire have I got to put out today I think um that like being nimble um I I notice it's the startups were the ones who are coming out with like you know other approaches or you know were the first to say this is what we're doing with shipping or you know this is what we're doing with our product line and here's a brand new product or something like that um for us uh what I learned from that was well first of all our community is one of the communities that were that is was you know severely hit by the pandemic um our community is predominantly you know vulnerable on the health spectrum for us it was like oh my goodness we cannot be insensitive right now we cannot start pushing promotions and sales we need to have some time out and I think there was a period where I, I called it a li- like an actual time out of pause where it was let's let's uh let's take this opportunity to really reflect on um what our customer actually needs because beyond buying products you know what do people really really need and then we started realizing that engagement and interaction with people was really um, a way of us to to get through it Um, and during the pandemic I think we engaged so much more with our customers and our 
um, and our, our community than we ever have before. And what happened was it started promoting, so our cup holder, um, which attaches to a wheelchair, holds a really perfect pint glass. So through the pandemic, we started having alcohol related posts, people showing us the cocktails they were making and then all the DIY they were doing with the attachment and the cup holder that we probably wouldn't have seen otherwise. That spurred new design ideas, um, spurred more opportunities for, oh, wait, what else do people really need around the home or what else can we do with our product line? And so for us, we saw it as a huge opportunity for designing new product. And and um, and also just I one thing that uh, I loved, um, despite the, the disaster of this, this pandemic and the way we're all still figuring it out what work from home looks like and everything for me it was the humor that's what I, I think we lived on was there was such a rich humor coming from our audience um you know everyone checking up on each other and making sure each other was okay but there was this humor that came out of it um which I didn't expect um you know it was like wine o'clock with the four a cup holder or something and just stuff like that just um made us feel like we were in it together like our customer is our expanded family um and and I think just the just thinking more about people in general um how we have more understanding for each other because of this pandemic it sort of hit reset for everyone I think um so yeah that that was some of the, the learnings so before we wrap up tell us what you envision for yourself as an entrepreneur what are some major milestones or achievements that you would like to hit in the near future? What's your ultimate dream? Moving forward, I would like to see that this company has made an impact um, to other businesses. That's really what I would love. Like, you know, we could have been a division in a company. We could have, um, you know, worked or collaborated or injected ourselves as consultants. But I would love to see how a brand can create change to other businesses. I would love to, for me as an entrepreneur, I would like to have more collaborations and more partnerships. I would love to see a major designer take us on and work with us. Um, for me, that's something I want. Like I want to see a, a well-known brand work with us um, because I just think we have the most incredible customer and incredible uh, bunch of people um, that any company would be lucky to to work with these amazing minds and um and see what innovations occur so i would love that i just want the opportunity to to work with others and um beyond that in in my life i haven't really thought thought further than five years <laughs> to be honest um i would say i would like to think that um that soon this won't be a topic of conversation. I would love that it is just so inherent in people's companies that things have to be accessible, that people are hiring people with disabilities and people are, you know, really, really making robust decisions with, you know, inclusion and diversity, full stop. And and um, I'd like to be part of that change. And yeah, that's, that is, it's a very altruistic, very, very, um, optimistic viewpoint of the future all right well I see great things in your future <laughs> as well. and just want to say thank you so much again for joining us and for sharing your inspiring stories and all of these great tips that our community uh, can benefit from thank you Lucy thank you thank you for having me